uh, let's start with last week's homework. Um, Nee, das wurde auch schlecht Was ist gerade Neurodynamics Klausur? Ja, Neurodynamics gerade noch. Oh wait. Um, last week's homework, simple regression at first. Um, Blah, 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 you were supposed to make the design matrices with Petsy, um, and Petsy just requires the same parameters as if you would use that model itself. So if you want to predict miles per gallon from horsepower using the data set cast, um, and as soon as you get those two design matrices, you can use these for the Spatz models OLS and capital um, method, and this will return you a fit object. And I uh, think in this script yeah. we can look at the, f uh, the result of the fit objects. Um, it's the first one here. Now you also have the task to uh, tell if that's what, what that tells us. Um, and what it tells us, we see here that r squared is 60%. So Miles per gallon, uh, oh wait, um, miles per gallon is explained, so the, the variance in miles per gallon is explained by horsepower, 60% of the variance is explained by horsepower. No. Yes. So this is highly, uh, highly relevant value, right? We explain 60% of the variance using this value, this is pretty much, um, so this is a highly relevant value. And if we look at the uh, p-value, it's under 0.000, so it's, it's, it's more than three stars, so that's highly significant too. So yeah, highly significant is the answer here. Uh, second one, multiple regression. Now we simply add more factors. We don't need Patsy's design matrices here because we use the SMF, uh, the Stats Models Formula API, and we try to predict this time we try to predict miles per gallon from horsepower, horsepower and weight and origin. And the result of the fit is this here. Now we explained even 71% uh, of the variance. And if we now look at this here, we see the origin itself has p-values of 0.01 and 0.13, so 1.1 um, and 13% probability, so this here is not statistically significant, uh, given that you also have horsepower and weight in pounds, which both are obviously highly significant. That, in one sentence, tells us that um, Americans, I quote, are not too stupid to build fuel-saving cars, they just like to build big cars. <laughs> so, origin is not relevant anymore given horsepower and weight. So American cars are just heavier and have more horsepower and that, that is why they consume more fuel. Good. And lastly, uh, the bootstrapping thing. So first of all, uh, we wanted to return the effect size, where the effect size, the effect size is uh, pretty easily done. We just need all the cars, so we subtract the mean of the cars with six cylinders by the uh, um, from the mean of the cars with eight cylinders. This here is the effect size itself. Um, it's also shown somewhere here, right? Which effect size, which value was effect size? One of these was. Okay, what is our effect size? Our effect size is negative five. We should see this value somewhere here too. Do we? Um, no, we don't, right? Okay, never mind then. Anyway, the effect size is just the mean of the differences. Pretty straight, uh, the, the difference of the means. Pretty straightforward. And then what you were, what you were supposed to do was the bootstrapping thingy. And again, in bootstrapping, we draw 
samples with replacement and we draw as many samples as we originally had in our sets. And now we have to differ between the sets with the eight and with the six cylinders because a data set is not balanced in the sense that there are just as many six cylinder cars as eight cylinder cars, which is why we need to uh, draw samples, um, as many samples as we had before. So this here is the uh, get sampling distribution. So we want as many, um, so we want, we, we, we draw 1000 times to do this bootstrapping. So we do this entire thing here 1000 times. And that is, we resample the six and the eight cylinder cars. How, would we, how do we resample? Where we draw, we sample with replacement, ziehen mit zurücklegend, the same size as our original data set. That gives us here a thousand times these two data sets, and then we simply subtract the one mean from the other. And this here now gives 1000 differences of means. And this is a nice distribution and we can get the 2.5 and the 97.5 uh, uh, percentages of this distribution. These are our borders. And um, the other thing was, uh, this is our confidence, or the borders for our confidence interval. And the other thing we need to return was the standard deviation where we have now a distribution, we can simply return the standard deviation. Uh, to make it more visual, um, I just printed the exact thing here. Um, I think Rudiger did it already in the lecture. Uh, so this here, I think it even gets bigger, or it doesn't. Okay, but never mind. This here is the distribution of means. So this is a histogram of 1,000 uh, 1, times we sampling the mean. And uh, then we see the effect size. This is the effect size of our original sample. This is not the exact mean of, not necessarily the exact mean, in this small of an image, uh, you don't really see the difference. But this doesn't need to be the exact mean of this because where we sample and the average can be somewhere else. Um, and then simply the uh, 2.5 and 97.5 um, borders, the confidence interval we see, this here with this is 5% of the data and this in here is 95% of the data. And the standard error is just where the standard error of this distribution. Um, I'll show it in bigger, I think. Yeah. So this here doesn't necessarily end exactly here. In this case, it does, because in this case, our sampling distribution made a perfect uh, bell shaped curve centered at the original mean. Not necessarily, but pretty close all the time. Any questions? No. Okay. Um, good. Then uh, let's go to the actual content of this lecture, making experiments. And uh, we said in the original description that we're going to use Psychopy, and we don't because Psychopy sucks. Um, no, seriously. Um, so I couldn't install Psychopy because Psychopy doesn't want to be installed. That's because PsychoPy doesn't support Linux. Uh, it also doesn't support being installed in a virtual box uh, in Windows uh, with the host operating system Linux. PsychoPy doesn't like Python 3 anyway and requires all dependencies and it's just, no. I, I tried it for hours. Rüdiger tried it for hours. The guys of, basic, of the basic Python course tried it for hours. It's seriously, you can't. It's just, oh, it really sucks. So, and if you look at the dependencies, like if you, the, the uh, install descriptions for PsychoPy as well as WX Python, which is a crucial dependency of PsychoPy, are uh, from 2011 and not updated since that. So they explain how to install it on Debian 6 and Ubuntu 2011 and so on. So that's, I don't know what's going on and why still anybody uses it, but we won't use it. Um, because there are nice alternatives. So the good thing and the reason why PsychoPy is so widely used is that PsychoPy provides a nice GUI and a program interface. So you can start by making a GUI and if you're a psychologist who doesn't know programming, you will do the GUI first and then you'll see some structures in PsychoPy automatically generating code from the GUI and then you can maybe work with the code. But in any way, the resulting code that you get is never going to be efficient it's going to be made by this stupid GUI where you just copy and paste and copy and paste and in the end you have 
if you copy one stimulus, you simply copy the entire code of creating the stimulus instead of it making a function for the stimulus, which can call over and over again. So the resulting code is never going to be good. The resulting code is, if you do, if you start with the GUI, so you have a huge lack of flexibility and control, and um, you wouldn't want that anyway, because we are in an advanced programming class here. Uh, we go for the pure uh, coding approach, which is why we uh, go for alternatives. And this alternative is um, experiment. Um, however, because um, uh, before we start with experiment itself, we're going to have a look at uh, Pygame. Pygame is actually made for games, obviously, that's why it's called Pygame. Uh, however, uh, you can make experiments from Pygame alone. Uh, many people do this. I did this actually for Hibijo. For and Psycho, uh, experiment and many other libraries which are there for experiments based on Pygame anyway. So it really makes sense to see how Pygame does it. And then you notice that experiment, for example, is just something on top of Pygame. Okay, so let's make an experiment. How do we make an experiment? What do we need for making an experiment? Well, we obviously need some kind of replication user interface because we have users which use our experiment. We need some kind of stimuli because we show something and we want to, for example, measure reaction times or something, but we need to show something, some stimulus. If we want to measure reaction times, we need some way of the user reacting, so we need some kind of user input, the user saying yes or no. We need anyway an, exper an experiment flow or a design of how we make our experiment, what, what, what we test, in what order, and so on, and how often. We need, of course, a way of data logging. If we don't log it, well, it's pretty useful. And if we make, for example, an EEG or an MRI experiment, we need serial port communication because we make triggers for an EEG over the serial port such that the EEG knows when what happened, if we want to correlate the uh, brain activity with our experiment. Okay, let's start at the top, start with graphical user interfaces. And like I said, many rely on Pygame for visual stimuli, uh, providing basic functionality or making Pygame itself easier. So let's look into Pygame. Um, Pygame doesn't want to be called from an interactive kernel because then it crashes eventually. So I just run um, the scripts, the Pygame scripts from the terminal. It doesn't change anything. The content is in here. Okay, so if we just run this code here, I'm first going to run and then I'm going to explain it. Aha, we have some program. Yeah, uh, which we can hopefully close. Yes, we can. Okay, so what was going on here? Well, we imported Pygame, obviously, and then, well, this is the typical Python main function, how you would do it. And then, um, well, we start by initializing Pygame. Pygame needs to be initialized for everything to run. This just needs to be the first thing you always call in Pygame because otherwise it doesn't start anything. Uh, then we saw that our window um, had actually uh, a caption and an icon. It's a pretty useless icon because the icon is the image of the, of, uh, the program itself and the title is minimal program. So. We need to load this image, which is going to be the icon, using pygame.image.load. Then we can set the icon using the method. We can set the caption. And then we have to tell Pygame um, about how we make the screen. And for that, we need pygame.display. And then we can simply set uh, a size of the display. So this is obviously a pretty small display, but we have to set a display, a display mode. Otherwise, Pygame can't open. And then we go into the so-called, uh, well, game loop, and that is that the Pygame window only stays active as long as our program is still running. So we need some way of keeping our program running, and that normally is an infinite loop. So we simply have an infinite loop while two do something, and this normally, if we had an infinite loop, um, our window would be completely uh, unclickable and nothing would work on, the, uh, on our GUI until we disable and until we uh, stop the kernel. And we need some kind of event handling for closing the GUI inside our main loop. And this is this um, pygame.event.get. So everything that you click on the GUI is an event, or every button you press is a pygame event. 
And in every Pygame sends basically a message and that and queues into the events. So we have here basically a list of events, which is empty as long as nothing happens. And as soon as it clicks something, Pygame.event gets built. And what, for example, fills this Pygame.event is pressing the X at the top right corner. And this is then an event of type um, Pygame.quit. And if we encounter this event, so we have to go through the, uh, through the list of all events that just happens if they are not empty. And if that event occurred, we have to, well, we want to stop our program, so we set our one to false, it will end the loop in the next iteration. So this here is um, the main game loop. Uh, yeah. But uh, in the beginning, the, the event list is empty, right? Yeah. Uh, how can you, uh, can you re-enter the for loop? Because... Uh, well, you don't. In the, the end, the star is empty, but then you stay in this infinite while running loop. The for loop will be entered again and again and again and again. Okay. A few million but times. Then. Kind of messy. Um, yeah, but that's how you do it. That's the only way how GUIs actually work. Okay. That's they need a main game loop. I mean, we could we could instead simply here uh, sleep for ten seconds or something. That has the same effect, but the window is frozen and we can't click anything on the window now. So this will show the GUI, but the GUI is now frozen and we can't do anything and it closes itself after 10 seconds. The only way to get an interactive GUI where you can actually do stuff is to have the uh, infinite loop and uh, handling everything over the events. That's just how GUIs work. Uh, GUIs must, uh, in any case, always, like, it, this is called active waiting. This it stays active. Um, it, it does nothing really and it could be, uh, uh, well, it is actually in a waiting state, but it's, it's not on the CPU, it's not in a waiting state because the CPU always asks for events and this is the only way how to get GUIs. In Python you also have the main advantage that GUIs must even run in the main thread. So if you want, for example, if you have another thread which wanted to print something here, like you have, I don't know, if you actually have a game, you have an AI which uh, controls uh, enemies or something in the map of the game, you actually want to update the position of the enemies on the map, on the GUI, you have to have some kind of, uh, you have to tell, you have to, the other thread has to tell the main thread to please update the display because the side threads cannot update the main thread. So this is really annoying, but this is just how you have to implement it and how you have to get around it. But it's all possible, you can just pipe this stuff, whoops, uh, you can just pipe this stuff um, to the main thread, but it's not relevant for us because we have one thread anyway now. Just so you know, active waiting, this is how we do it. Okay, um, then I said we have to set the display. So this here set the display as we did it. What we can also do is we can toggle full screen if we want to be in full screen mode, but keep in mind that toggle full screen takes this small screen and stretches it such that it's presented in full screen mode. If we want to be real full screen, we have to find uh, our screen's um, native resolution, which can, for example, be done like this. So if we, we, can set, we can list the full screen mode and then set the mode to our full screen mode. And this will present something actually in true full screen. Yeah, active waiting and the main game loop. Okay, as much for the GUI, we now have a GUI window that's fitted with something. Let's make some kind of stimuli. We need something to show to the user, obviously. And how this is done in GUI is that you um, anything, like especially in Pygame, that you have to um, that you have to create anything as a surface, and then you have to put this surface onto the main surface which you're using, which is the screen. And once you did that, you still have to flip the screen because the screen uses a front and a back buffer, and everything, every surface you copy to the main screen, you copy to the back buffer, which is not shown yet, and then you flip front and back, and then everything which used to be at the back, at the back is at the front and you can refill the new back buffer. Um, sounds complicated, what you in fact simply do here is, for example, we load an image here, and then we blit it, so we put this image, this new um, surface, we put on the surface of the screen, and then we have to flip the display, display for it to actually be shown. And if we do that, where we see an image on the screen. Note that we don't have a main game loop, which is why the screen closes really quickly again. 
Okay, so we have this image here. It's its own surface. We put this surface on the surface of the screen. And of course, it's not seen yet. We still have to flip the display so that the back buffer will be drawn in its cell. Yeah. Why, why did the window look like Windows XP? Because that was the image that was in some example provided. And I was too lazy to look for another image. I'm going to use a smiley in a later example. But I was too lazy to change the image. It's actually good because it's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually it is. Um, OK, um, next to images, we can also have uh, text on the screen. Um, and if you want to do that smart, like if you want to have a text in the middle of the screen, we need to play one with the coordinates because we have a window in this case which is 240 by 180 and if we want to put, put it into the middle of the screen we have to find the, the, mid, the, the uh, middle of these coordinates and the middle of the surface of our text because if we put it simply in the middle here it will start at the exact center of the screen and it will, not, will, right, it will be uh, the, left, the top left corner will be at the center of the screen and we don't want that, we want it to be really in the center of the, center of the screen so we need to keep the, the uh, size of our surface also in mind because we want it to be, we want the center of our surface to be at the center of the screen if we want text at the center of the screen, right? So how we would do that, um, I had this get position function here for that, which takes the screen and the surface and um, uh, a constant where, so this here is just either center, new line center, bottom or top, and then it calculates where it would put it. So if we want something to be truly at the center, the position is center of the screen minus center of the text and height of, uh, height of the screen uh, for the same uh, for the y coordinates, the same thing. So this is how you actually put something at the center. And if you want to have it uh, comfortably, it makes sense to make a, this a function for this to always find the center. Yeah. Then we also need some other constants. We have black background, so screen size is now 800 by 600, or font size is depending on the display size, also makes sense I say, and our font color is white. And yeah, if we now want to set, so we now initialize Pygame, we set our screen to this 800 by 600, we fill the screen in black, this is how we actually erase text. We simply fill the screen with the black color, this erases everything which is on there. Nice. Way, easy way, logical way, straightforward way of filling the, of erasing text. And then we have to render the font. So everything which we put into Pygame, even text, are still surfaces. Surfaces are for images and text alike. They are just treated the same way. And now we make a font. So this here would be the font style type. But keyword arguments are not allowed in Pygame. I have no clue why Pygame doesn't want keyword arguments. Um, and this here, this is now a font object and that can render text. Okay, so we create the text surface by letting the font render our text. This here is anti-aliasing such that it, it looks less blurry, right? Um, this here is the uh, font color and the back color, background color. And then we want the position, then we want to position it as the exact center of the screen, so we need for our get position method, which I just explained, so we want to be in the center of the screen. For that, we need the screen size, the surface size, and all of this. This will be at the top. Uh, and then we blit our surface, and then we need to flip our display again because otherwise we wouldn't see anything. And then we have the center. Then we have the text at the top of our screen. And then we can see for five seconds such that we actually see if we printed the text. And now, ta-da! Yeah. Can you explain the flip method? So Pygame uses a front and a back buffer. If you draw something onto the screen, you don't draw it live onto the screen, but you simply draw it on the buffer of items that will be Can printed you on the what screen. A buffer is? <laughs> something it's less, just a container where the objects will be. So you want to present all objects at the same time. Normally, you, so if you have a game, your game has a certain refresh rate, 60 hertz or something, and every so that means that 60 times a second you draw a new image on the screen basically. And if you have, for example, like imagine you have a game where you have moving foes, moving, like you're moving yourself or something, then every movement will not be directly drawn on the screen because that takes too much uh, 
because then you draw for the foes, you draw 60 times a second on the screen. If you draw for your own movement, you draw 60 times a second on the screen and everything, and that doesn't make sense. It makes more sense to let to prepare something like as soon as we update the display the next time, please draw these all things on the display. And this is then the back buffer. This is just something where the data is stored such that it can be used together later. So as soon as your own movement is updated, you draw your movement on the back buffer. As soon as the first movement is updated <coughs> or calculated, you draw the first movement on the back buffer. And then as soon as the uh, display refresh rate, so once every 16th of a second, Occurs, you flip the display so that everything which is prepared so far will now be drawn onto the screen. Because otherwise you would use your replica, graphics cards too much, for, exa for example. Not, not, not quite because it's actually for calculating, but this is how you would do it because you don't want to display, um, update the display all the time. So you just have a back buffer and a front buffer, you always draw on the back, and as soon as you flip, you replace the front with the back and create a new empty back buffer. And the old front buffer gets the back buffer? No, it just gets lost. It just disappears because you don't need the contents from that anymore. They were presented, and that's it. Can I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, you can do that without always flipping the screen, but that's something more complex. Are we actually going to do that right now? Because okay, now we presented an image on the screen, so let's make something moving. How do we make something move? Well. The only thing we can do is put, a, put an image on the screen and then we have our loop. And we can say, well, if you want to move, then just every iteration of the loop will just change your coordinates a bit. And this is how we would do it. So we create an image surface. This time it's not the stupid image, but it's mighty anymore. And this set color key simply makes a white transparent. So this mighty has a white background and this is going to be transparent. Not completely because the image quality sucks because it's a JPEG, but never mind. And then, where well, this here are original positions of the image, and this here is how much the image will move every frame. And then, in our active waiting loop, so in our infinite loop, we simply, well, we update our positions. First of all, we pay attention that as soon as we left the display borders, right, image.get height, um, uh, screen.get height minus image.get height, as soon as we get out of our display, we simply reverse our step, such that if we moved right before, we now move left. And then we simply update our x and y position by the step. And then we make a blank screen, right? We, we delete everything we had on the screen before, erase everything. Then we print our image to the screen. We have to flip the display again. And then we sneak for a second, such that we actually, for not a second, but a tenth of a second, a hundredth of a second, such that we actually see what happened. And then this here is the way the the, um, the end uh, the end condition again. So as soon as we press the X, there's going to be an event whose type is quit. Uh, and as soon as we are, that occurs, we simply break out of our infinite loop. And this then will show something moving. Yeah. So, and but this again is really inefficient because we always need to flip the entire screen. It would be more efficient to not flip the entire screen all the time, but to use so-called dirty rectangles. So if we know we printed this image here to the screen here and we didn't print anything else, we could, in fact, decide to only update this rectangle of the screen. This is then the so-called dirty rectangle because this is where the screen is dirty. This is where the screen is needs, to be, needs to be updated. This would give you high performance if you would actually use it, and this would help you get rid of the flipping, constantly flipping the front and back buffer because you can simply update part of the screen. You say, hey, this rectangle of the screen, I want to show something here. Um, this would work, uh, but it's a bit more complex, so we don't need to show it. But yeah, this is how you show something in Pygame. This is the only real way of getting movement into Pygame, having an infinite loop and telling, updating the position constantly. Probably, yeah. That's <laughs> probably the screen server. Looks exactly the same. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I muted my laptop, but yeah, Pygame can play sound. Pygame can play sounds too. So we simply we need to initialize Pygame always. We need to pre initialize our Pygame mixer, and then we can simply select the sound and let it play. So Pygame can play sounds too. 
I can get further also the user input. And user input again is we looked for the quit event here, and user input again is simply an event. So we need our infinite loop, and then as soon as someone as, as soon as the user press the key, there's going to be a new event of type pygame.keydown. So if we encounter an event of type pygame.keydown, we can check for which key the user actually pressed. And so this is how we would make um, functions that test if a key was pressed. So this here is again an infinite loop. So this this is somewhere in our script, right? Now at this at this as soon as the um, as uh, the code reached this line, we wait for any key, which is we stay in an infinite loop and we stay there until the user press the key. So we look for all the events that are there, and if the event is of type key down, we check if the key which was pressed was of type. So in this case, uh, we also want to be able to exit. So what this here does is, uh, if the user pressed escape, then the wait any key function returns false, such that we can end our program if the user pressed escape. And if the key is not escape, we simply return the number of the key. And again, if the event was of type quit, so the user pressed the X in the top right corner, we return false too. So what we can do now in our main program is we can at any point set use the function wait any key, and if wait any key returns false, we simply exit our program. And this wait key basically does the same thing. It just doesn't look for any key, but it only returns, so it returns false if the user pressed the, the X or escape. It stays in the loop if the user pressed any other key than what we're looking for, and if the user pressed the key which we're looking for, which we return true. Okay, so they are what's left from the game loop. The game loop is now in this function. How can the quit um, option be under the key presser? Um, because it's an event, so this here is if that is an event of type key and this here is if it's an event of type quit. Okay. So either you quit, so this returns only once obviously, but either it returns false if you press X or the escape button, or it returns true if you uh, press some other key, like the which key. And it stays in the loop if you press some other key. And how is which always translated into pi, pi game dot key something? Um, these here are just constants. Um, so what, what do you actually have to um, prepare an object for this? No, these are just numbers. Um, so that's how you. That's that's how I did it. Uh, how I did it um, further up too, right? I had these um, positions here: center, new line, center, bottom, and top. So this, if I enter here center as where well, this is just the same as if I would enter zero. It's just some like it, it's a mnemonics, mm -hmm. mnemonics. Mnemonic, mm -hmm. I've said. So these constants are easier to remember. You could also uh, learn the ASCII table by heart. Um, and then you knew that the escape key has ASCII number 27, but that doesn't matter. So this is just some constant, and key down is also just some constant. It just makes it easier. Okay, and now that we also can that we can also wait for a key, let's put everything together. This is again what we used before, so we want to be able to put some text somewhere. We have our functions for wait for wait for waiting for any key and for waiting for a certain key, and now what we do here in our program, so this is the, the longest Pygame program you're going to see because uh, this is the end of um, explaining Pygame, so this obviously we want to eventually play a sound, so we need to pre-initialize our mixer, we need to initialize Pygame, um, we set our screen mode to this 800 by 600 screen, uh, we make an empty screen, we need a font object, we need a second font object because we want to print stuff in different font sizes, so we have one font and one small font. And then we let the big font render the text, clear, press left for even numbers and write else. We want to present this text at the center. We actually present this text at the center. Then we have the small text basically continue. Present that well, one line a bit below the center. We also blip back to that to the screen, and then we flip all displays. So now, as soon as we hear in the code, you're going to see this and this text 
when they're at the sensor and one below the sensor of the screen. And now we wait until the user presses space. So if we get here, this here is an infinite loop which stays in this loop until we press either space or the X or escape. And if we press X or escape, then we return our main and return our main function. So we exit the program. So this here returns false, we exit the program. We press something else, then space or escape. This will stay in the loop. And as soon as we press space, we go wherever uh, we go after this function call. And then where we need to prepare the speech sound. And then four times um, where we, we look at the previous number such that we don't print the same number twice in a row. So this is just uh, selects a new number. So this is a random number between 1 and 0, and we have this three numbers such that we don't present the same number two times in a row, because then you wouldn't see that the number change. Oh, oops. Um, then we erase our screen here, we fill it with a background color. We render the number we just, so we made a random number between 1 and 9 here, and now we render it to the screen, in the center of the screen, flip the display, so we actually, so we build it and flip the display, so we actually present it. And then we wait for any key. And so if this here was false, then what happened? The user pressed either the X or escape. So we return back to the main loop. And otherwise, um, where we want to look for um, the left or the right key. And what, what, we said at the, what we said at the beginning, so we said uh, we wanted the user to press left for even numbers and right for else. And we, we don't lock anything. We don't save the response times or something. This is just to show you the real basics. So we just simply play this beeping sound if the user pressed left and the number was not even, or if the user pressed right and the number was even. So in this experiment, quote unquote, um, we simply have to press. So you, you get a sound if you're doing it wrong, if you're not pressing left for even and right for odd numbers. So we now, we, we had the space to continue part, so we now write here in our code, so in this infinite loop, uh, not infinite, so in this loop, we exit this loop, so now I press escape, our program closes, right, because return, now I press space, and we see a number here, and the number is uh, odd, so I'm supposed to press right, I'm going to press left, and the sound plays. So this here is hot, I'm going to press right and right and right and press left. And we presented only four numbers, right? Because we had this loop here for only four times. Uh, somewhere, there's the loop. And yeah, that's it. And if you would now additionally measure response times and save the data somewhere, you would have some kind of basic study. And this is how you do studies without anything else than Python. So now, experiment. Experiment builds on top of Pygame. Um, we don't shop Psychopy here, but experiment. And experiment is made for exactly everything which we need. So we had stimulus presentation and so on already. Py experiment is for more. So what we can do with experiment is we can, we can design stimuli, we can, we can design our study. So we have an experiment which consists of blocks, of blocks and blocks consist of trials where we can present stimuli, lots of different stimuli. We have stuff for IO such that we get mouse and keyboard input, and we can send triggers, for example, to the parallel report or something, um, where we have a clock and uh, buffers anyway, and we have this main control, which I'm going to show it first anyway. OK, all of experiments models can be used independently. You just need an accurate clock. You can also simply use the clock from experiment or whatever else you want to need. You, you need. Okay, let's start with the experiment co experimental control. So every experiment experiment just needs to be in this, just like we have the main game loop for Pygame, every experiment experiment has to have this certain structure as specified in the controls package. And that is that it starts with control that initialize, um, then you well, initialize whatever you, you want to initialize in your study, then start between start and end, there's going to be the actual experiment, and then ends and the experiment. And I'm just going to show you how it looks like before explaining the rest. So we need the design package 
to make an experiment. So every experiment is a design dot experiment. We can give it a name. And then we need the control package for this main structure, the backbone of our experiment. And then we initialize our experiment, and then we start it here, and then we end it here. And this, I can actually run in, uh, in Jupyter because the experiment is a bit better there. If I'm in interactive code, like Jupyter asked me if I want to be in window mode, and yeah, I want to be in window mode. So normally, this would be full screen, and this would ask me for a VP number now. Ah, it does still, oh, yeah. And now let's say I'm subject number one, it initializes, now it's ready, and now it waits two seconds. Uh, as soon as I press a button, it, I just press the button, waits two seconds again, and that's it. So what do we see here? Um, well, PyGay uh, experiment, um, where it makes stuff obviously a, a lot easier for us because we simply need to initialize an experiment, and as soon as we initialize an experiment, PyGay makes already a screen for us. The screen is always full screen, as long as you're not in the developer mode, which I just selected. Um, and it always starts with you entering uh, the VP number, so you don't need to code that yourself. Every experiment experiment simply automatically saves the VP number as soon as you uh, hit control.start, and it automatically locks stuff and so on until, uh, and it saves it until you um, go to control.end. So, we're going to get to how the file looks in a second. So just, it has two different files, one you specify, and one which is automatically created and locks everything, which is pretty huge. Um, but we're going to see that this, uh, later. So first of all, when we initialize, we make this huge screen. It, it makes a screen object, a keyboard object, an event log file, and an experimental clock. And then, as soon as we hit start, it asks us for the subject ID, which is also saved as exp.subject, to be saved later, and creates uh, the data file, which we can fill ourselves, exp.data. Between start and end, then, we iterate through our experimental design, which is with an experiment consists of blocks, which consists of trials. And then end ends an experiment and saves the data in log files. So here, we don't do anything. Before we initialize the experiment, we simply sleep. And then afterwards, why don't you show it? Oh, that's really nice. Okay. Code switch. So yeah, so this here is all after the initialized part, it prepares the experiment. So this prepare experiment taking two seconds, so it shows the, the text prepare experiment as long as we have code here. So this was just showing the prepare experiment for two seconds, for two seconds, because it's that two seconds. Uh, then we enter the subject number, this is a control.start, and then uh, experiment waits for 10 seconds. This took longer than 10 seconds. Um, it waits 10 seconds to be more accurate in timing because Python, according to experiment, is only properly initialized after 10 seconds. And because in experiments, proper timing is crucial, it makes sure that, the, uh, that everything from Python is initialized properly before starting the actual experiment. And that takes a lot of work from you, which, may, which is really cool. Okay, um, so now from now on, we're always gonna show stuff on this small screen here. Um, because uh, we can do so. This is the develop mode. Normally you would use the normal mode, which is full screen, but we use develop mode here to show you stuff. Okay, and then let's go through what we know already, how to do it in an experiment, because it's easier done in experiment. Let's look at stimuli. For that, experiment has um, the package experiment.stimuli, and to show the stimuli in a demo, I'm going to use a context manager. Aha, a context manager, so we have that in session three, um, which just takes the burden of always having to write initialize, start, and end here. So as soon as we enter the context, so we, as soon as we create this context manager, um, we initialize. As soon as we enter the context manager, we call control.start and return it as exp, such as I can do this here. And as soon as we enter, we go for control.end. Right, so this here is just such that I can write with stimuli demo experiment 
instead of having to write those four lines because I'm lazy. Uh, okay, um, so now how do we present the text? Um, we make a stimuli.text line, so there's a, a text line class and stimuli that has the arguments text and text size. Um, we can also make a fixed cross, this is already prepared in stimuli.fixed cross. Now we present the fixed cross, we preload the target um, because loading um, stuff like like loading any kind of stimuli always takes a few milliseconds. And because experiment really wants to be precise about its timing, it can preload them such that when you present them, actually, it's exactly on time. Experiment makes sure to be exactly on time, also because uh, like it, it can show, that it, it knows when to show the stuff. It really puts, uh, it aligns showing the stimuli according to the display update frequency so that you really, it's really certain that it presents it exactly on time, so it makes sure that it's always presenting on time. And then I also said that experiment has this clock object, or experiment has an exp.clock, which is basically the same as time.sleep, time but more precise. Uh, and then, yeah, as soon as we're ready, we show the fixed cross for a second, and then we show our text for a second. Right, so we presented the fixed course, we waited one second, we presented our text, we waited one second. We presented something to the screen. This is how you would do an experiment. And you see it's standard in the center of the screen, so we don't need to find the position of the center of the screen. Pretty easy. Okay, um, there are sound stimuli, which is a stimuli.tone. Soon as I start the experiment, well, we can we play our tone, right? We have a duration of 200 milliseconds, a frequency of 2,000 hertz. Doesn't make sense. That's too high for 2,000 hertz, right? Anyway, but yeah, and then we wait one second before we close our program again. Um, we can present objects to the screen, like here a rectangle. This here is a stimuli dot rectangle of size 50/50 at the position 2020, and the color is red. So again here, we work with constants, and they are an experiment, they're an experiment.list.constants, and then the name of the constant. So we again have constants for keys, which are k underscore, and then left, right, a, b, c, one, two, three, whatever, backspace, whatever. And we have also color names on the constants, so the color red is uh, the uh, constant C red. And then, yeah. We don't need to preload if we don't if we want, don't don't want to be precise about when we actually present it. We don't need to preload. First preloading and then presenting doesn't make any sense anyway because we don't save time if we preload it right before we present it anyway. So it's no way use of preloading. Uh, but yeah, we can present it and then we wait a second so that we actually see it. And voila, we made a 50 by 50 square on the screen at the position 2020, which is a bit above the center because. The position zero zero is the center in the experiment. Yeah. And what does MISC stand for? Um, it's the package. The experiment provides these sub packages: design stimuli I/O MISC. This is just MISC ranges. Okay. If you want to present multiple objects on the screen, um, you see that in experiment we don't have to flip the buffer, right? Um, but this is a problem if we want to present multiple objects because as soon as we present something, whatever we presented before is gone. It's not if we don't clear the screen. So present the present method of objects of, type of class stimuli as clear and update. Clear means we erase everything before such that we don't need to fill the screen with a background color again. And update means where we actually flip the display afterwards. And if we want to, press, if we want to print two things on the screen, where for the first one, we need to clear the screen because we run only this minus here, but we don't update our buffer. And for the second one, we don't clear the, sc the screen because we want this here to, to still be present, but afterwards, we want these two stimuli to be shown. So for the second one, we need to update the screen. So in this case, ta-da, ta-da, we present two circles on the same screen. Wow. Okay. Uh, a nicer way of presenting, however, of presenting complex objects is uh, to make a canvas. So now we have a button and a text. So the button is a rectangle, the text is a text line. We have uh, our canvas here, which is simply a blank, a blank screen. And then we plot our button as well as our text onto the canvas, and then we present the canvas. So now this canvas, yeah, line hunt, 
contains the button and the text, and if, as soon as we present that, we present everything which is on the canvas with it. So what will this be? Will be an OK button at the lower right corner of the screen. However, we can't click it, right? <coughs> there's there's not even a mouse cursor because we don't have keyboard uh, we don't have keyboard or mouse input yet. So this just shows a button for five seconds. But we're going to get to how this button makes actually how we actually put that button to use in a second. Yeah, defaults. Uh, we saw now that we um, so. Experiment simply works with the default system for every settings it has. So what font we normally use, what background color we normally use, what font size, what display size we normally use. And we can simply overwrite those defaults. So, um, well, let's set first of all the develop mode defaults again so that it will stay in a, in a small center and a small in a window screen. And then we can say, for example, that we want to be in window mode standardly. We want to have standardly a window size of 800 by 600. And we want our screen to be of this color. This is some kind of red, right? It's red and green a lot, blue not much, so this is some kind of red. And this is, we would simply set these defaults before we initialize our experiment. If you want to know what defaults can be set and how, the link to the um, API, to, to the docs of experiment is at the bottom, and you're going to see what kinds of defaults there are. So you can just simply overwrite them, and as soon as you then, then create an experiment and initialize and start it, uh, it's going to use these defaults. So this here is going to be something pretty normal. Um, wait for 10 seconds. There's also a default where we can turn off the 10 second wait, um, for example. And yeah, now we got a, a, a yellow background instead of our standard black one. But because I don't like this color, I'm going to restart the kernel again. And I'm going to re-prepare the Steamily demo such that we can use our context manager. OK, as much for Steamily. Questions? Then user input. Um, we have the I.O. module, which is for logging and user input. Uh, again, it can be used independently, and so on and so on. So as soon as we created an experiment, as I just explained, we have an exp.keyboard. Right? And exp.keyboard has the method wait. And wait simply waits for a certain key. You can specify for which keys. You can specify if you want to wait only a certain duration and then give up if the video is too slow. We can say if we want to wait for a key up. We can call callback functions if the key was actually pressed. I don't actually know what the last one is. But um, yeah. So if we want to um, wait, for a key, we simply well, we have our we return our experiment as exp, and then where we create a text line again, we present it, and then we simply wait until the user presses a button. And the keyboard of wait method returns which button was uh, pressed and the response time. So yeah, we don't need to code it ourselves. It simply returns how long it took from here until here. And then if we print the button and the time. Uh, where we can either we can save our so any key to continue and now it's going to be true if I press the backspace and press the backspace so now I took I pressed the button with the ASCII code 8 and as we see in the ASCII table down here the ASCII code 8 is actually the backspace um, it took me 1.6 seconds to press the button and yes we can also check for constants so this button was the button backspace so Mr. Thompson, so K backspace is simply uh, it. So yeah, this is how we would uh, wait for a key. We can do the same thing for mouse. So let's have our OK button from before, but let's make it a close button. So we make a canvas, we plot the button on the button text on the canvas. And then what we do is uh, we have exp.mouse, just, just as we have exp.keyboard, and we can wait for a press. And that then returns the button ID, the position, and the response time. Button ID 0 means left button. And we can simply, for the position, we can simply use the method button, which is our, uh, our rectangle here, dot overlapping with position, and then our position. And if we actually press, so if the, the position we pressed is overlapped by the position of the button, then we do something, namely we return. So as soon as we're ready, I also needed to set the exp.show.mouse show cursor because otherwise we wouldn't see the cursor here. And now if I can click anywhere and it doesn't do something, but as soon as I click close, 
eight nodes. So this is how we would be able to use the mouse on a spider web. Yeah. So uh, the position, why is it not only like one point in the middle of the rectangle? What? It is. This here is simply an XY tuple. But the button has a method overlapping with position. So the button knows its, uh, its position and its size. And the method overlapping with position simply checks if position.x small or post.x, position.y small or post.y, position.x plus size.x bigger post.x, and the same thing for y. Just convenience, it's a technical job. OK, uh, we knew everything from Pygame before. Let's get to something which experiment can really do new, and that is experiment design. And in the, the general structure of an experiment should always be where we have an experiment. And in Pygame, that's what we turned by the method design.experiment, right? So we created a new experiment. Um, where is it? Uh, and this is then the, our EXP. And this experiment consists of blocks. So we have different blocks, so first half, second half, or practice first half, second half. Or I don't know, if we want to test two different things in the same study, we could have the same block for the, we could, we could use one block for the first half of the study and then one block for the other, whatever. And they're just blocks. Somehow, sometimes it doesn't make sense to have blocks, somehow it makes sense to have one block, but it depends on the experiment. And then every block consists of trials, and in the trials, there are probably one or more students. Um, I'm just going to show you one experiment which was coded in experiment, which is the Simon task. Um, so it shows us instructions. We have to press the left button if we see green. Um, and now we see now, uh, rip, this is white. We see a few times these buttons here, rip. And this was the first block. And now in the second block, we have a new instruction which says press left for the red key. And um, this is the Simon task. It's um, a task about the fact that if the stimulus is on the left side and you have to press the left button, you're better at it. Even though the fact that the stimulus is on the left side doesn't have anything to do with which button you press. Humans are faster to press the correct button if the stimulus is on the same side as the button. It doesn't matter, but this was just to show you that uh, we had an experiment and that had two blocks, namely in the first blocks we pressed left for, left for if the, the stimulus was red or green, I forgot one, and the second one was the other way around. Okay, and then each of those, so we had two blocks, and in each of those blocks we had a trial. So this here is a trial, new trial, new trial, new trial, and so on. And in each trial we see a stimulus, which is this rectangle, and actually another stimulus, which is a fixed cross. But um, it's actually not a fixed cross because it's not part of the trial. Okay, but so what we would do here to make this experiment, we would make two blocks, and in every block we put a certain number of times um, the, we have a certain number of trials, which is a certain number of times showing this button. Um, so. And for that, we use the experiment design package. Okay. So what we do is we make block trials and stimulus. So we simply make a design dot block. We make some trials and we make some stimuli, and then simply we add the stimuli to the trial. We add the trials to the block, and we add the blocks to the experiment. So we now have one experiment having one block, which has one trial, which has one stimulus, which is this one. Okay? So if we now, and this is just a really, really easy example, right? We have one block, one trial, one stimulus. But the main loop of how experiment, experiment wants you to loop over that is that you go through all blocks, for blocking these field of blocks. Then you would probably, before starting this for loop, you would give instructions, hey, in this block you have to do this and this. And then you, in this block, you go through all trials. You can shuffle the trials, of course, before, and we'll show that too. But then you will show every single trial, and then 
you would do something with the stimuli of the toy. In this very easy example, I go through all stimuli and present them after each other with a half a second in between. That last one does arguably not make sense because you want to sometimes put that stimuli, of course, at, at the same moment and so on and so on. But uh, this is just an example. So what we do here, well, we only had one block with one trial with one stimulus, so we presented the circle for half a second, and that was our experiment. Okay? So why do we even want to have blocks and trials? Um, because blocks and trials can have factors. So in the one block of uh, the assignment task, we had the factor for well, left equals green, and in the other block we had the factor left equals white. If you want to lock your data, you simply can save which, uh, which block it was and what the factors of this block were. Okay, so let's look at a, a bit bigger example. So we make our experiment, we initialize it. This will prepare simply a blank screen and preloads it such that the blank screen is now always available as blank screen. Then we make one block, um, name it block one, and we set the factor color as green. So in this block, we can get factor, color, and it will return green. We make one trial in our block, we put one stimulus into our block, namely a green one. We add the stimulus to our trial, we add the trial to our block, we add the block to our experiment, and now we make a second block, block two. And in this here, we make the factor color red. So if we block two dot get factor red, the dot get factor color will return red. We add, um, and we add a, a red circle, and add the stimulus, the trial, the stimulus to our trial, the trial to our block, and the block to our experiment. So we now have an experiment with two blocks. And so to just show you that we can get the factor, so we start with the first block, we print, now we're printing, and then we get the factor color of the first block, which will turn green. Um, and then we go through the trials there, and we present the trials, and do a bit, and then we go through the, the second time, and we will now present. Um, uh, 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 one wet colors. So now we see, as soon as I press ready, we will print here. Now we're printing green, and it will show the green one, and then it will say, now we're printing red, and we're printing red one. So green and red. So this is just, that's why you make blocks, because blocks have factors. Trials can also have factors, but we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, of course, initializing them like this is exactly what I was just complaining about. So if you would have a GUI and you would drag and drop the blocks into your design, this is how it would look like. Uh, the fact that we have this, we can of course set them algorithmically. So we're doing basically pretty much the same thing here. So we have first left, white, and green, and then left, white, and, and, and red. So we go through, we say first green, and then we say red, and we use the color green, and then use the color red. We make a block where we get this color here, green stimuli, red stimuli, set the factor color, color to first green, then red. And then in each of the blocks, we present the left and the right stimulus. So we make a trial at first for left and then for right. We said trials can also affect us to a certain extent. Right, and the position here is then negative instead of left or right. And in each trial, we have a stimulus, we add the stimulus to a trial, we add the trial to a block two times, and then we add the block to our experiment two times because we go through both, through two, both loops two times. And then, um, well, this is how our, our main loop. For every block, we go for every trial, and every trial, we show the one stimulus we have. Okay, so. So this is the green block, this is the red block, and both have a trial with left and right. Okay. Um, yeah, blocks also provide the possibility to shuffle trials. We simply have the shuffle trial method. You can even set that we don't want the exact same position twice in a row, or three times in a row or something. Um, this is actually harder than it seems, and at the bottom, I'm not going to present it today, but uh, at the bottom I have a bit of how you would actually try to shuffle that, because shuffling is actually harder than it seems, and this doing it in a dumb way, namely shuffling until uh, we found the right distribution takes uh, O of infinity time, which is not the good. But yeah, we can shuffle twice. We can call block.shuffle twice, we shuffle twice, and that's all we need for now. 
Okay, um, what's also really cool is that we can use the design package alone and export the design to other libraries. So I made here some kind of study design. We apparently have only one, no, we have, so we have the first block here, right? We have three conditions in this block, A, B, C, and we add five copies. So we add to a block five times A, five times B, five times C. Then we make a second block, which is just the exact same one as the original one, block with copy. But we shuffle the trials in both, and then we add both blocks to the trial. So if we now look at demo design, it would tell us we have two blocks, and in these two blocks we have 15 shuffled trials of 5 times A, 5 times B, 5 times C. We should. So if we now look at it, it was, it was a CSV, it's a commented CSV. Some CSV videos have a problem with that, and you just have to ignore the first two rows. But yeah, you see, this here is the block. We have 15 of 0, 15 of 1, and um, where we have trials, 1 to 0 to 14, um, and the trials are shuffled because the trial ID, we see this is 3, 7, 13, something, this is obviously shuffled. And yeah, we have the conditions A, B, C, C, B, A, B, B, blah, 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 blah shuffled. So we have 15 times. Uh, and this is again a reason why it makes sense to have different blocks, because in theory, you shuffle it really, really badly. You could have all the A's at the front, and then all the B's, and then all the C's. That would be a really bad shuffle, but that could happen. And if you have blocks, you at least make sure that you have exactly 15 times, uh, five times A, B, and C in the first half of the experiment, and A, B, and C five times in the second half of the experiment. So you have to see when and how it makes sense to make blocks. It's dependent on the experiment, but yeah. Now I when you know, have to check about that, I think. Yeah, that's clear, that's clear, good. Then we need between subject factors. Um, sometimes in some studies you want to test uh, something where, where it's not about the, the where, where it's about the difference uh, in the subjects depending on what you tell them. So for example, in this one heavy job I did, we had sentences for the one subject, we, all, we always said we had files versus when, also files ich dahin gehe versus when ich dahin gehe, whatever. And to the one group, we only presented the false cases, and to the other group, we only presented the when cases. So that we see the difference there. Actually, not, not like this, but it was shuffled, but never mind. Okay, so um, this is, imagine this would be our data set for that. Okay, so we have um, every sentence has four conditions. Namely, this here is the, uh, this here is the when condition, this here is the files condition, right? When versus files. And then we have another condition which is there were and there were versus there were and there, there were not and there were. Okay, so the course of the subjects get the condition with the whens and the es gab und es gab. The course of the subjects get the, gets uh, the ones where the case is false and es gab nicht und es gab, uh, es falls und es gab und es gab. And Quote of the subject gets then, es gab kein und es gab. Quote of the subject gets falls, es gab kein und es gab. Yeah? Just you have two conditions and you split them up between every subject and then you have four different subjects. And this here is just, uh, so this here is the first of these, this here is the second of these, and this here is the third of these. So we just, normally with this would be like 100 something, 150 eventually, but yeah, this is just the dumped down data set. Normally we even had eight different conditions, but, but you, you get the idea from this like that. So this is an original almost uh, CSV. And now we use the between, between BWS, between subject, no, what does it stand for? Between subject factors, BWS. Um, and that simply selects one of those four conditions depending on the subject number. So. I think I have to enter, no, this is the when case, okay, you don't, this is the when on, and the as gab, as gab case, as you saw. Um, is that developed mode false? That's weird, it should normally ask me for an ID. Hmm. One second. So if it would, would ask me for an ID, you would see that every ID, which is evenly divisible by four, gets the first condition, and every other gets, so, right? So this is depending on the subject ID. Why didn't it ask me for the ID? That's weird. Subject number, okay. So now if I have the subject number like 24, I'm not 100% certain, but I think 24 gives me the 
uh, last condition, which is the when, nee, the files und es gab nicht, es gab. I'm not 100% sure. Files, es gab nicht, es gab. That's what I said, right? Yeah. So yeah, we have different conditions. How do we do this? Well, this is a bit longer code. Uh, I set the develop mode to false so that you see how I enter the subject ID. We want to be in window mode, enter the 600. We don't have the initialize the delay, so we don't wait for 10 seconds here. We make our experiment, we initialize it, and then I just showed you the CSV, right? We read the CSV uh, and we group by conditions such that now we have three different data, uh, four different data sets, right? We know how pandas works. And we have one where the first row of each is, so this here and this here and this here, and then we have another one for every second and every third and every fourth. So that's just shows how the CSV looks like. Okay. And it makes it, I mean, I drop an A, right? So the empty lines are going to be dropped. And then um, we iterate, so we have now four different conditions. We iterate through these conditions, and for every condition we make a block in this example. And this block is called condition. So like I said, I, I deleted four of the conditions. So these are only one, two, five, and six. So we have condition one, condition two, condition five, condition six. In every block we set the factor where we actually will remember such that we remember which one we had. And then we go through all of the sentences for this condition. So for condition one, it would be Dennis Kauf, Bernd Blumenstrauss, blah, 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 Timo Kinder, Timo Geri, blah, 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 Eva Molina, and Samus, and so on. We set the factor item number such that we remember which sentence it actually was. Maybe all subjects have problems with the same sentence because the sentence was just weird. And then we go through all the sentences here. So we have S1 until S7 here. These are the column labels, column labels of our data frame, right? And we simply add a stimulus. We make a text line for every of these sentences and we add the stimulus to our trial. So this is the first time they actually have. So we want to present now the stimuli one after the other, right? And then we add this trial to our block and then we add all four blocks to our experiment. So now our experiment has four blocks the first one will show the first, always the, the condition equals one. So this line, this line, and so on. In the second block, it will show the condition equals two, and then, and so on, and so on. But what we said, we wanted the different subjects to get different conditions, different conditions, right? So what we do is we add this between values vector, uh, between, between subjects vector, and we have the files then condition and the garb garb condition, which is either then or files or garb garb. Got this got. Yeah. And then what I do here, I don't know if it's actually a smart way, but it's just some way of how I came up with it. We simply remove the other three blocks for so now we can get we can use the method exp.get permutated w dws factor condition. And this here is something which is so this here the files then condition is when for half of the subject. And the guard guard condition is guard guard for half the subjects. And depending on which group you're actually in, we simply delete the other three groups. Okay, this here sets, so that there, there are only ones in there. And then what we simply do is we, we add them to a list to delete. And then no matter what, 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 what kind of, uh, what, what your experiment number was, at this point, to delete contains three different conditions, all the ones which you're not in. And we simply remove the blocks of that condition such that every subject is left with only one block. This is also a nice way to abuse the blocks. I don't know if it's a wanted way from experiment, but it makes sense. And then we can have the condition for you. So we just saw con so the last person, the number, XP number 24, divisible by four, so it gets condition six. Okay, and then we print which, which, which uh, exact conditions this person got, and this person got the gap Gab, gab nicht, gab condition and the files condition, which is what I just told you. And if I now do the same for subject number 25, this should get the when condition and the gab gab condition. And number one all the time. So we see here it gets condition one, which is the gab gab and the when condition. So this is how we would do it between, value, between subject vectors. Yeah. Because I disabled the full screen. 
because I set the develop mode. Uh, no, I set the develop mode to false, but said you are in window mode, so that you can see the text additionally to like because full screen mode sucks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As much for that. Um, what we didn't do yet is saving your data, um, but the actual text only five minutes. That's, I should be done pretty fast actually. Even though it doesn't seem so. Um, so, what we didn't do is we stop. We didn't stop the time yet. What can we do to stop the time? Well, we can import time, then do what it will do, and then take the new time and subtract the original time. Uh, yeah, this makes sense. Generally, Python's time function is pretty okay, but not as accurate as you may think. Um, it's pretty accurate for Windows, for Linux and Mac. Not well, 16 milliseconds is still not too much for Windows, but it's still not perfect. Uh, for measuring time difference, Python wants you to use the performance counter. I mean, yeah, the difference here is like, I don't know how to interpret this difference, but Python just wants you to use the performance counter, and then you can subtract the start, the start time from the finish time. Um, but keep in mind that this is never 100% precise. And another caveat is that in older versions of Python, it was actually recommended to use time.blocked. And time of clock, for example, doesn't make any sense because it's completely different in Windows and Linux. On, on Linux, it only calculates the processing time, the time of active waiting. And if you're sleeping, this is not processing time because your program tells the scheduler of your CPU, hey, you don't need to look at me for the next second, so please do something else. So your program gets zero seconds of CPU time in between. And Linux and Mac, if you do the same thing here, not with time of time or time of curve counter, but with time of clock, uh, it will return zero. And on Windows, this function returns the wall clock seconds, so the, the number of seconds since you started the computer, which is something completely else than on Unix, and I don't know why it does so. But here, because I slept for a second, the CPU was busy doing other things, there was basically no time in between, which is really stupid if you would use that in a study because then everything would be screwed. Um, Pygame is really nice because Pygame is explicit about its timer resolution. Pygame simply has a constant timer resolution which depends on your operating system and your setup. So Pygame guarantees me that it has a resolution of 10 milliseconds. An experiment um, is, the experiment clock is even better, so it should be used at all times. The experiment clock it makes sure that it uses the best time your system has available. And what's also really cool is we had this preload already before, right? Because Pygame is afraid that presenting this text too long, it can preload it. And cool enough, preload returns the amount of milliseconds it did take to preload its stimulus. Such that, such that if you um, wait for whatever you want to wait minus the time it took to preload, then you're certain that you're waiting, so if it takes 100 milliseconds to preload this and 50 milliseconds to present this, then you wait for 150 plus, three, plus uh, 350 only. So you can use this in waiting, uh, you can use the, the preload functions and even the present functions while waiting to, so in the waiting, so the waiting time minus that, to be sure that this is really accurate. So now every letter is going to be shown for exactly one second, right? Yeah. So this is really precise about the time. Experiment is really precise about time, nice enough. Good. And uh, the last thing is data logging. So uh, I already explained to you that it, so it doesn't make sense to go into too much detail about that because it's pretty straightforward. So as soon as an experiment, as an experiment ended using control and end, two files will automatically be saved, the log file, is an event slash some the name of the experiment, the VP number, the timestamp, or XPE, which contains basically everything. It's really huge, the content of that. So it's a detailed description of everything, of uh, the entire design of all IO events and of all times it took to load, even to preload the stimuli and so on, just everything, and the data file. And the data file contains simply what you manually saved during that. And how do we manually save something? Well, we, when we, before we start the experiment, we simply set exp.data variable names, and then we can set some names. So this is, the, the data file will simply be a CSV. So we need the 
names of the columns for the CSV, which is the data variable index. And then we simply xp.data.add and then whatever variables you have, whenever we do. So um, this here is, uh, I made this response time.py. This here is the contents of the response time.py. Um, just to look at it. So we're setting develop mode again, make an experiment, we preload the fixed cross on the black screen such that we can put up a quick bus. We make one block and one only block. We make a random waiting time in between. We set the factor waiting time for this trial. We present, so we add um, the surface stimulus to our trial. And then at the trial, at the stimulus to our trial, at the trial to our block, at the block to our experiment. Then we have to set the variable names. And what, what we want to look, uh, what we want to lock are waiting time and response time. And then we go through our hierarchical system here for all blocks and for all trials. We present the fixed course, we wait for whatever we specify the waiting time is, this random time here, minus the time it takes to preload the stimulus, such that we will be precise here. We present this one stimulus, we um, wait until the user presses the space key, and then we save the response time. And how do we save that? Where well, we simply exp.data.get and then the waiting time we get using the get factor and the response time. So if we run this, um, let's run it. So so we see it's random times and I'm taking, so let's take real long so that we see this time it will be like three seconds in between, the response time was three seconds at one time. How many did I have? Okay, so. And now we can look at, um, so now we created a response type 01. Um, you may be wondering why I don't have that as code in here, but as an external file, because if you run experiments in an interactive kernel in Jupyter, the names will always going to be interactive kernel underscore, because the, if you run an interactive kernel, normally, the experiment name is what you specify here, my, my experiment, which is why the file is now named, oh no, it's named response time because the file is called only one. The, it takes the file name of the file and then makes the other name behind that, the number behind that, the VP number and the timestamp. I disabled the timestamp here, which is why um, we don't show that. Um, and then uh, if you want to take the file, it will always be the same number and that's why I have to extend it. But if we now open our XPD file, we see that it's a CSV file. Again, it's a commented CSV file, so we need to ignore these lines because they just explain something, how this experiment works, which is nice that it does it for us. But yeah, subject ID, waiting time, response time. So we edit here the variable names, waiting time, response time. The subject ID is always automatically added, and the numbers is also automatically added. So it's one subject, subject one. And then, yeah, we saved the waiting time, which was this random number here, and the response time. And we see here, there I took, in the uh, fourth last um, trial, I took three seconds to answer. So this here is really accurate and really good, and blah, blah. Okay? Um, and if we want to print this nicely in pandas, like I said, we simply print it. So this here is simply a function which finds the first row which does not start with a hash, and the first non-common row, and then we read the CSV skip rows such that we skip everything and we see here nicely formatted in pandas we can export that to pandas yeah similar triggers real quick um if you so I've, I've never used that myself because i've never done something with an eeg but this is how you would do that you can set exp dot serial port to a serial port for that you need the python serial packages in the standard lib and then as soon as you do something, you can call the method exp.serialport.write. And then that sends simply bytes to the ports. And this is already a perfect trigger for an EG. The EG will know what to do with that. And then we need to close the port again. Note that experiment is really, really, really fast sending the EEG triggers. So it's here, yeah, the serial port latency is under a millisecond. So it's just really good to do so. Never done that myself though. <laughs> yeah. And then lastly, exporting data, this is the last thing. So we now have this here for one subject ID, and now let's have it for multiple subjects. So imagine we had now 10 subjects, and they're all in the data folder. 
Ah, okay, I need to. Because I use underscore underscore file, which is not defined in vector coins, I have also this external program. And we had, so we found one subject data sets only. Now it's this which just merged the, the files, right? This makes simply one data.csv out of all our subject files, which we automatically created. And then if we look at this, well, we only had one subject yet. I can do that again, and then we would have two subjects. Um, but I think you will leave me, right? This is how we make one data frame model. And then I would have this example of uh, a code. Um, this is what I showed you before, only in the long version, right? With the left equal with the Simon task, it's called. Um, but I don't need to show that. You can look at it at home. You're going to code some experiment yourself anyway, and then you need to look at it anyway. Good. So this would be it. I mean, you could have looked at the, well, the results, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, this would be it. If you want to actually know something about PsychoPy, um, I added the basic program in Python lecture from this week, last week, which was about PsychoPy and its environment, if you want to really look at it. And if you want to know more about experiment, go to the website, go to the introduction paper, look at the docs, and if you're unsure about how to make your own experiment, there's the experiment stash, where there are like four or five examples, example experiments, and yeah, you can use that to make your own. That would be it. Thanks for your attention, guys. Yeah. In the homework, you're actually supposed to make your own. Um, so only study design, because you can't test GUIs. And this is how this is a Steinberg task. This is how it would look like if you did it. So it presents a random number, so, random, so between one and six random numbers. And then you have to memorize them, and then you have to then it presents you a number, another number, and asks if it was part of the sequence. Yeah, we're gonna code that now, and we're gonna interpret the data in the next session. So yeah, three, four, okay, two was not in the sequence. So this is what we're coding now. You make the so the entire display is already given. So how we display the data, the stimuli. Uh, it's also described in the in the um, Pinsy file, in the readme, and yeah, you have to make the design, the which I so you have to make the blocks and add the to the blocks and so on. Yay! So next week there will still be a lecture. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no homework. Doch, aber die ist ja für euch bestimmt hier oder so. Auch noch nicht fertig. Ich gehe auch auf die Fusion, wenn keiner kommt. Habe ich es auch gerne nicht. Oh, schön, der Flamme sollte Mike nicht sein. Für den Kurs kriegt man noch jetzt nur Pass oder Fail, oder? Ja. Also, du brauchst nicht mehr zu machen, wenn du schon alle gemacht hast. Nein. Das ist äh, nächste Woche dann Thema? Das, ähm, also wir sind noch nicht. Ich habe die Daten von dem, von genau diesem Steinberg-Task, ähm, von also nicht gemacht in Experiment, sondern gemacht in irgendeinem beschissenen Psychologen-Tool. Ähm, aber mal gucken, ob die die auswerten. Das ist so der momentane Plan. Und ansonsten noch keine Ahnung. Sollten wir noch Seiten, wolltest du noch drin haben und Scikit Learn. Aber halt auch nur so, hey, guckt euch das mal an, kann man machen. Abhängig davon, wie viel Zeit ich habe.